Daytona. That's all you have to say. One word. Whether you're from South Boston or South America, everyone knows Daytona, the world center of racing. Richard Petty holding on to that lead like a hammerhead shark. Dale Earnhardt finally is a champion of the Daytona 500. There are 36 races on a NASCAR Winston Cup schedule, but only one race to turn an underdog into a legend. And on the outside, it is car number 10, Derek Cope. The Daytona 500, the great American race. Bobby Allison, Davey Allison, his son in second. Sterling Marlin's going to win it. Bill Elliott, two-time winner. They touch. Cale Yarbrough goes out of control. And there's a fight. Waltrip trying to slingshot. Petty is out in front. He slides up the racetrack and Jack Gordon will win it. Bill Jane is going to pull it off at Daytona. Darrell Waltrip, he's done. The one in Daytona 500. The one in Daytona 500. Petty. Pearson, Yalbert, Earnhardt. Who wants to add their name to the list of winners? I do. I do. I do. This is the road to the 2003 Daytona 500. Six weeks. 43 drivers. 500 miles. One winner. Halfway. And now this race would be official if it fell victim to rain. We're going to see what all these guys have got now. There's no holes barred now, baby. You let it all hang out. Let the rough side drag. What can they do to get those two teammates together? Right now, they're split by Michael Waltrip. Boy, Michael's all over the back of the 48 car. And here comes his teammate, Bernhardt hey, Jr. I, you know, that's help. But he's not going to give him help. It don't look like Darrell. He went to the outside. He All he's worried about is getting those two laps back. Jimmy Johnson, starting his sophomore season from El Cajon, California, leads them down for the restart. Dale Earnhardt Jr. at eight car, remember, two laps down after having that battery problem. He would love to clear Jimmy Johnson to take the lead of this race and get one of those laps back. Well, the caution come out. See, right here, he's going to pull Michael by Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson hung out to drive. On February 16, 2003, Michael Waltrip added his name to one of NASCAR's most exclusive roll calls, two-time champion of the Daytona 500. But the road to the 45th edition of the Great American Race had officially begun 41 days earlier. The empty garage was invaded by racing's best when the new year was barely seven days old. Awakened from a short winter slumber, first light at the massive world center of racing was the first sign that a new season had arrived. When you sit out there waiting to pull into the tunnel here at Daytona, USA, you know, it's the sun's starting to creep up over the horizon. You know, it's just, it's a great feeling. You know, that's what it's about. We, we love to come to Daytona and get ready for the Daytona 500. But January testing is not the time for reflection or romanticism. It's the time for work. 52 teams caught up in a pair of frantic three-day scrambles for speed. Countdown is on. The Daytona 500 is only six weeks away. It's all about speed. How quickly can I go? The cars are just now making their first laps on the racetrack, so you have to see what they run. Kind of guess to, show, to see how much they're actually showing. I think everybody's trying a lot of new things. They've got new body styles. We've got new rules with templates, so I think it's finding out what our limits are and where we can go with that, and, and hopefully you can come out of here in competitive manner. The big trophy will go to Tony Stewart. The Rushville Rocket from Indiana is the 2002 NASCAR Winston Cup champion. Less than 24 hours after clinching the 2002 NASCAR Winston Cup title at Homestead, 
Tony Stewart was already in testing mode, leading a pack of teams anxious to break in their rides for 2003. It's all the hard work over the winter time, the wind tunnel testing, testing at the Daytona mandatory test, you know, going to going doing some straight line testing, stuff like that. The winner of the Daytona 500 is pretty much the winner when he rolls out. So much preparation goes into these races. You don't run up front without having a very organized, thorough, uh, great support group in that race car to be able to run up front and restrict play races. And, particularly the Daytona 500. It's, it's unbelievable the amount of man hours that goes in for this one event. It's, it's mind boggling. The time between uh, Thanksgiving and uh, let's say the uh, about the end of the first week of February when we come back down here, we really are, are doing double time. For the off season, there's always twice as many things for the number of days available that you can get done. It's really a struggle. Five weeks later, the champ was at it again. Chevrolet and Pontiac brought newly redesigned cars to the beach, the Monte Carlo camp boasting the addition of Stewart and his Joe Gibbs racing teammate, Bobby Labonte. Dodge answered GM's challenge with a new nose for the Intrepid and a pair of new recruits from Penske Racing. The Dodges of Mike Wallace and Kyle Petty topped each session followed by the Mike Skinner Pontiac and a bevy of Chevys, including Michael Waltrip and Christian Fittipaldi. A dozen Fords took their shot at the top of the charts, but none climbed higher than fifth on the coveted sheet of speed. Daytona in January is a frigid game of stock car poker. Some teams choose to hold their cards close to the vest. Some go broke with a desperate hand. Others simply bide their time until February, waiting to call the competition's bluff. All of the teams that are in the top 25 or 30 points, none of them are showing their hand. We always run as fast as we can. I mean, we've never been in a position where we've had a car faster than everybody else's where we had to hold back before. So uh, we run as fast as we can all the time. There's no one here at a test that is going to show you everything. End of story. When we come back, we will go faster. Everyone will go faster than you did here testing. Car owner Robert Yates arrived at Daytona with a new look for 2003, a look of relief. Throughout 2002, internet rumors and garage whispers created a constant media swarm around this quiet 35-year NASCAR veteran. It's good that a calendar year is only uh, 12 months instead of 24 months. Because <laughs> I was happy to get last year behind us. Why? Because change was in the air, a lot of it. After three seasons with Yates, Ricky Rudd was out. Also gone, longtime sponsor Texaco Haviland, departing to join rookie Jamie McMurray at Chip Ganassi Racing and one of the most storied numbers in NASCAR history, the 28, was shelved to make room for a new young star, the 27-year-old Virginian, Elliot Sadler. Man, I've never been this excited in my life, man. Those, Robert and Doug and that whole organization, just 100% race team, period. Uh, they have a lot of resources, a lot of people. Uh, the fab shop is unbelievable. Everybody knows about the engine department that Robert Yates has. The 2002 Daytona 500 runner-up would return to the beach as teammate to three-time Daytona champion Dale Jarrett. He's going to make it. Dale Jarrett's going to win the Daytona 500. Yeah. I think it's going to be great because we're already, you know, really good friends and get to share that common goal of winning races and trying to win a championship is, I think, a bit will get us that just that much closer and just looking forward to working with him. Uh, you know, if we can't win the race, I want those guys to win the race. After eight months of ugliness, a new team meant a fresh start for Yates, and perhaps a little Daytona deja vu. Here he comes to the line, and Dale Jarrett is gonna pull it off at Daytona, his second Daytona 500 win. <laughs> wow. Like a repeat of 96, 
come down and uh, turn the winter circle right off the bat and that kind of thing. But uh, you don't know. That's why racing is so exciting. That's why it takes your breath. That's why it does all these things. That's why we even buy the tickets. Yates and Sadler set into motion a bizarre off-season of rapid-fire roster changes. Rudd replaced Sadler in the famed number 21 Wood Brothers Ford. Nick Murray was joined at Ganassi by Casey Mears, who inherited the number 41 Dodge from Jimmy Spencer. The nephew of IndyCar legend Rick Mears joined a rookie class that included 2002 Bush Series champion Greg Biffle, two-time Craftsman Truck Series champion Jack Spray, and Larry Foyt, grandson and employee of the great A.J. Foyt. Bobby Hamilton left the Winston Cup ranks to go full-time truck racing, and fellow veteran Spencer landed with Ultra Motorsports. That car had been occupied by Casey Atwood, the only driver left standing when the music stopped. In the days before Speed Weeks, the frantic pace of testing gives way to the heavy metal of preseason preparation at the race shop. Overseeing it all are drivers, crew chiefs, and car owners. Ray Everham has been all three. He's all the way to the bottom, almost in the grass. He slides up the racetrack, and Jeff Gordon will win it for the second time. Wow, what a race. After two Daytona 500 wins with Jeff Gordon, Evernham knows the preseason checklist by heart. The Dodge Intrepids of Bill Elliott and Jeremy Mayfield are nearly ready for their 10-day trip to the beach. Welcome to Evernham Motorsports. As you know, we're getting ready for the Daytona 500, so there's an awful lot going on. But this is our entrance. We invite our, our fans and our partners to come in and, and visit. As we walk through the hallway, this is the break room. Now, lately, the guys haven't got a, a chance to use it. Johnny keeps it filled with drinks and there's food, but again, the guys don't get too much of a chance to take a break. This is our weight and training facility for the pit crew. They ran out of things for, to put on there for me. I used it all up, and so we're waiting for more to come in so we can get the proper amount of, of weight on, on there. Here, wait a minute. It, I don't want to flex and, and rip this new shirt, so I, I'll be careful. But um, when the rest of the weight comes in, I'll, 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 I'll show you what I've got. <laughs> Everything Daytona preparation starts in here. Starts from getting the chassis finished. Once the guys make all the modifications that we make that are custom to our cars, the car then gets put together with a mock-up suspension on it, and it gets taken over here to a chassis plate. And all good Daytona bodies start here. The Dodge components are supplied are the nose, the, the tail panel, the roof, the deck lid, and the hood, and everything else is handmade. This is the template rack, and most of the templates are off because they're using them. This year, almost half of the templates are going to be common from each manufacturer. So again, the body shapes are going to be very similar. What's going to be critical is how you use your templates and how well you put them together. I've promised them, and I'll say it on TV, as hard as they've been working around the clock, when they get through Daytona, I'm going to send them all to a few-day trip in the Bahamas with their families. But they, uh, they've been working around the clock, a lot of shift work. What they do by putting the finishing touches and templates on the cars is very important. So body and paint shop is one of the busiest places that we have getting ready for Daytona. Out in the country past the city limit sign, well, there's a honk at all near the county line. The joint starts jumping every night when the sun goes down. Hey, there we go. That's it. When you've got all those late nights and everybody's working hard, you need a little extra entertainment. And we have it built right in here at Everham Motorsports. We really operate as one team that runs two cars. And Jeremy's cars are on this side of the shop. Bill's, Bill's cars are on this side of the shop. The guys work together. They work hand in hand in assembly. Getting ready for Daytona. You might as well take the clocks off the wall so the guys work on the job, what they have to get done. The you-know-what hits the fan around Daytona time. Uh, there's stuff all over the place. You've got new uniforms coming in, people being sized, decal changes, sponsor. This is Buddy Cram. He's my director of operations. From the crew chiefs, there's a complete checklist the car has to go through to make sure that all of the, the operations that were supposed to be done are done. 
there's a pre-race check sheet and there's a qualifying checklist that each car again will have to go through before it's loaded. So hopefully we'll have a successful Daytona. For 2003, there's nothing more that I'd like to have here than the car that wins the Daytona 500. But as you know, they keep that car in Daytona USA for a year. So in 2004, as hard as these guys have worked, I'd love to have you come here and see an Everham Motorsports Dodge that had won the Daytona 500. Jeff Gordon's first 500 win came in 1997, just his fifth Daytona start. And after dominating all day, his crew out on pit road, Bill Elliott wins the 1985 Daytona 500. Bill Elliott's first came in 1985, only his sixth visit to the Speedway. For others, winning the great American race is far more challenging. In 1980, Buddy Baker won in his 18th try. And after all those years of effort, all those heartbreaks, the 1980 Daytona 500 waving like mad as he crosses the line. Buddy Baker has got it. Five active legends came to Speed Weeks 2003, each with at least that many starts in the 500, but nary a win to show for their efforts. Ricky Rudd, Terry Labonte, Rusty Wallace, Kyle Petty, and Mark Martin shared nearly 140 career race victories entering 2003, but not one on the sport's biggest day. Well, it'd mean a lot to me to win the Daytona 500. I've come so close so many times and haven't done it, and uh, boy, I, I can't wait to get it done. Yeah, I would love to be able to, one day when my career wraps up here, that uh, look at a trophy on the shelf that said uh, Daytona 500. I don't think there's anybody in racing that wouldn't want to see that. This is going to cost Dale Earnhardt the race. He's overshot his pitch. They have to pull the car back in order to meet the rules. He just needs a couple of quarts. He's gone on his way, and it looks like Mr. Bodine is going to be the beneficiary. Four-car shootout to decide it all. Dale Earnhardt. Here comes Duke Coke down on the inside. Dale Earnhardt has Earnhardt a problem. Sloppy back. Something does amiss. After two decades of misfires, Dale Earnhardt finally won his first and only Daytona 500 in 1998. Checker flag. Dale Earnhardt finally is a champion of the Daytona 500. No matter how impressive a driver's resume, there is no void more glaring. No race more revered, no trophy more desired. Dale Earnhardt went so many years without winning that 500, and it's special when you come this many times, you keep coming back and trying and trying and trying. So if I win it too early, maybe I won't respect it as much as if I win it later in my career. If you just look at the Daytona 500, it's incredible the things that have happened uh, in people's racing careers and in their lives uh, that have either made them or, or helped make them or, or either kind of broke them down uh, for a number of times. So it's just incredible to look back on uh, what has happened. Petty is out in front at the line. Petty wins it. There's so many big events that have happened at Daytona that uh, if you come to Daytona and don't want to win, there's no need to come. If you're going to be successful, and the expectation is that sooner or later in the sport, sooner or later you're going to be able to win the Daytona 500 as a driver or as a team owner. Obviously, this is where NASCAR's heartbeat is, and, and um, everybody wants to win the Daytona 500. That's one, uh, one trophy that you always look forward to and you always try to get. And, um, you know, no different. Right now, we want to get it as soon as we can. We'll get one now and get one, uh, you know, more than one. But uh, it should be nice to win one. Man, I don't think uh, a fairy tale can be written that sweet. Uh, all 43 teams that start that race want to win the Daytona 500, and every team should feel like they're going to win it and, and can win it. But uh, I think we got a little something for them this year. Speed Weeks 2003 began under unpredictable skies. As rain fell on the Daytona International Speedway, uncertainty reigned in the garage. NASCAR's tech inspection line opened for business at 7 a.m., nine full hours before the first practice session. The age-old dance to see who could get away with what had begun. As 
as crew chiefs and mechanics tried to squeeze their way past NASCAR's red shirt police force, the sun tried to squeeze its way through the clouds, and neither was having much luck. for a new season to begin, we'll just have to wait a little longer. And even the most dedicated fans found their patience stretched. We even got our hamburgers and hot dogs out already. Everything is gonna <laughs> be a film. Go. We're not 100% set up yet. <laughs> so you're, you're all by yourself out here, though? All, all by myself. Okay. I, because I live for racing. Gotta be here on race day. We'll ride out the rain and see what happens. We're here, we got our cards and games, we're all set. We'll have uh, plenty to do. We're getting ready. I need something to scramble eggs in. Now if we'll get some sun and get some cars on the track, we'll make our day. Then the clouds began to break up. One, two, then a dozen cars were suddenly on the track. Fully painted, ready to run, the 2003 season finally underway. Time was already short, and the Budweiser shootout was only one day away. Practice for the All-Star event marked the first time teams took on the draft in their race trim. During the Friday night session, it was Texas Terry Labonte who set the pace as the paddock buzzed about the promise of Saturday night's event. But as the garage closed, cars remained lined up, still trying to gain approval to run the Daytona 500. After 15 hours, inspection was still not complete. A cold front rolled into Daytona behind the rain as Saturday temperatures barely crept into the 50s. Programs, look at programs. But the only chills in the grandstand were found up and down the spines of race fans, powered by the promise of the season's first race a race held under 3.6 billion candle power of light. All right, it's time to turn the lights on for the Bud Shootout. As darkness fell over the speedway, 19 drivers sharpened their focus on the task at hand. The long off season was over. The race is running two segments. The first segment is 20 laps. The second segment is 50 laps. Roll out, let's index our wheels and get in the habit to do so. The inspector will be out there in between the cars. Give them a thumbs up after you prepare the race. Pull back on your wheel, then forward on your strength system. Good luck to each and every one of you. Fifteen pole winners from 2002 and four past shootout champions would duke it out over two segments on the line, $200,000, and the title of favorite for the Daytona 500. Let's go on, Matt Chambers. Let's go again. 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 Let's go
return to the rear of the field. Dale Earnhardt Jr. had drawn the final starting position and was now marching toward the front. 14 laps into the 20 lap segment, Jr. took the lead and stayed there. Segment two would be a marathon compared to the first stanza, a 50 lap race to the finish that would include one frenzied pit stop. At the drop of the green flag, longtime rivals Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Matt Kenseth went door to door. Kenseth guns for the lead on the outside. As the halfway point neared, crew chiefs began to plot their one stop in the pits. Jeff Gordon was now the leader. Would everyone wait for the 24 car to duck down pit road, or would each driver take his own path to the finish? The crowd knew the answer in an instant. The majority of teams changed only two tires to assure track position. An even gutsier foursome passed on tires altogether, electing only for a splash of fuel. That was exciting. Yes, it was. It was. I couldn't believe all of them came down. I believe that down. team would have been on pit road at one time. Look like, like a covey of quails coming at us. Mark Martin rode his no tire strategy into the lead, but the pack was already gaining. With 15 laps to go, Jeff Gordon hip checked his way back to front. 15 laps to go. On the point, Mark Martin, but Jeff Gordon has run him down and goes for the lead, fighting Schrader on the outside. On pit road, crew chief Robbie Loomis watched the laps click away with his driver in front. 11 laps to go. 10, 9, then 8. 8 as in car number 8, Dale Earnhardt Jr., who was suddenly charging up the outside with only five laps remaining. Speed weeks, man. I'm telling you, I think we're gonna have good things this year. And uh, I'm real nervous because the winner of the Daytona 500 didn't have such a great race season. But uh, hopefully, we can make make a difference this year and win the 500 and the championship. Just like his father six times before, Dale Earnhardt Jr. was the champion of the Budweiser Shootout. And just like his father, over all of those many years, Earnhardt was now the odds-on favorite to win the Great American Race. But that was still a full week away. On Sunday, exactly seven days before the Daytona 500, the rains returned. Trucks churned through the wet and jet dryers blasted at the blacktop, but qualifying would have to wait another 24 hours. On Monday, the Daytona sunshine was back and with the intensity of the sun came the pressure cooker of qualifying day. All of the off-season hours at the shop, the millions of dollars spent on research and development, the hopes and dreams of a career in NASCAR, it all comes down to two lonely laps on the racetrack. As the drivers and teams wait for their crack at the clock, everyone wonders who will be able to pull a rabbit out of their helmet. The preseason favorites started to run their laps. Jeff Green quietly prepared for his shot at the top. 
One of those favorites was 2001 Daytona 500 winner Michael Waltrip. He did not disappoint. 48.528. That is a killer lap. That's 185, lap. over 185 miles per hour. Briefly, Green acknowledged Waltrip's blazing run, then shifted focus back to his number 30 Chevrolet as it went through NASCAR's final inspection check. 26, 27, 28 cars took their best shot at Waltrip's speed of more than 185 miles per hour. No one was even close. Driver Jeff Green helped roll his car into position to take its turn. But first, the track belonged to the new king of Daytona, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Pull for Dale Earnhardt Jr. Wow, man, 48-28. Finally, Jeff Green was given the nod from NASCAR. It was time for Green to drop the hammer. Well, hold the phone. Jeff Green, who was so quick in the first practice, he didn't even bother to go out in the second practice. It's coming to the line, and Maynock Jr. off the pole. Did it! He did it! He did it. In less than 48 and one-half seconds, Owensboro, Kentucky's Jeff Green went from low profile to the high end of the pylon, and the driver of the number 30 Chevy became the 30th driver to earn the title, Daytona 500 pole sitter. I'm still shaking. I, this, you know, <laughs> this is easy for a driver, but I'm still shaking because just because of where we're at, Daytona is something else. The following day, there was a little extra strut in Jeff Green's step and a rather big target painted on his back. The fastest man in the garage didn't get to enjoy his time in the sun for very long. Practice for the Daytona 500 was officially underway. Fifty other drivers were now gunning for Green's blue and gold machine. As intensity rises, so does risk. Rookie Jack Sprague found himself in the middle of a 200 mile per hour game of ping pong. The result, a five car calamity, collecting Mike Skinner, Elliot Sadler, and Jeff Burton. Only 48 hours before the crucial 125 mile qualifying races, Sadler and Burton had to resort to their backup cars. For wreck to happen in the first open practice of the year is, is not what we're looking for. Um, at the same time, um, you know, we can't, the drivers have to take responsibility. I'm not saying anything, other, the drivers do have to take responsibility. I couldn't believe what I saw, I mean, on the straightaway, and, and just caused a heck of a wreck. It tore up a really good race car. I mean, we were very fast and unfortunate for the m ms car, and that's the same car DJ won with down here in the year 2000, so we're really trying to make history, but it's just, it won't, it won't meant to be this weekend. The wreck was a reminder of the dangers of restrictor plate racing and the rewards of being in the right place at the right time. The Daytona 500 was still five days away. Wednesday marked the final practice session before Thursday's qualifying races, and the cars up front decided to chase down the clock with every lap, the gap between the race teams and the 190 mile per hour barrier began to shrink. 187, 188, 189. Finally, two cars topped 190 miles per hour, Sterling Marlins Dodge and Ricky Rudd, who returned some old Daytona glory to the number 21 Wood Brothers Ford. As day five of Speed Week's 2003 drew to a close, tension hung dark in the air. It was time to go racing. On the morning of the Gatorade Twin 125s, the feeling is very different from the days before. There's a stillness in the sunny air. Uneasiness blows over the garage like a breeze from the beach. 
it is the calm before the storm. Up until this day, all focus is centered on preparation. Tuning up. In the qualifying races, the name of the game is survival. You go to that race hoping to learn something to apply to the Daytona 500. Now that's if you know you're in the race. If you don't know you're in the race, then you're going to that race just hoping to get into the Daytona 500. Well, Gatorade 125s are really exciting races, I think, all the time. Um, you know, it's a qualifying race, but now the way the cars are so even and as hard as it is to pass, when you take, instead of having 43 cars on track, if you got 25 on the track, it makes it that much harder to pass. There's that much smaller of a group. Yeah, I'd definitely rather not tear them up my car, you know, than take a huge chance and wreck the thing in a 125. I'm going to take care of the car and get what I can get. You leave, and now you've run a race on the car, on the track, similar conditions to what you're going to race in three days from now. Now you got some ammunition, man. Now you, now you can start working. Now you can start thinking and talking about, you know, this happened and that happened. And, and you put all that energy into the Daytona 500. Early to bed, early to rise, ready for the day. Big fun, man. Right now we're just setting up our scaffolding, getting ready for uh, the twin 125s. This is about my fourth time. Well, Warren, how many times have you been up here now? I've been coming for the last 20 years. What do we got going on here? Breakfast. Breakfast. For drivers starting up front, the goal is to get through the day with their Daytona 500 car clean and in one piece. For others, only a top 15 finish will guarantee a starting position in the great American race. Rock and roll. What's up, guys? Go out there and take it to the front. I'm ready to go, man. Plan is 14th or better right now. You don't have to sweat all that point stuff. Not very good points. What's up, man? Let us go fast. 50 laps. Get through a pit stop and uh, come out front, man. Strategy here, BJ. Try to come out in one piece. Learn as much as we can. Though. Don't have anything in mind other than just seeing what we can do. Make sure that we got something to work with for Sunday. This race will decide rows two through 15 on the inside for the Daytona 500. These races are exciting. And you go into it and trust me, I'm a race driver. I got my helmet on. I'm in a race car. I'm not thinking about anything except what Jeff Green said. I'm gonna go to Victory Circle and get that trophy. Jeff Green led race one to the green flag streaking into the lead and daring the competition to keep up. Tucked in behind was teammate Robbie Gordon. Robbie radioed in and said he wants to run the high line, but his crew chief Kevin Hamlin told him to stay low. Robbie is afraid the outer line is going to be faster. Gordon followed his teammate for 31 laps. Uh, you want me to stay with him, or if the outside line looks like it's going to go, can I go? Larry Foyt got caught in the middle right there. That's not a very comfortable place to be, particularly for a rookie. When she gets ditched out of the pack, I mean, you're, you're there just hanging on. You know, you're, you're hoping to find a little hole where you can sneak back in, but most likely it's closed already. <laughs> 
32, it was time for the only pit stop of this race. And like the road racer he is, Gordon outbroke his teammate during the duck down pit road. Robbie Jefferson, keep that thing on the bottom all the way around the racetrack. They can't pass it. Gordon held on to the lead over Green and won the first race of the day. I think it shows RCR cars are going to be really competitive. And I'm um, just, just real proud of all the guys, all the hard work they did over the wintertime. And it's, uh, it showed when we rolled out of the box here. Get me there first. Get me into Daytona 500. Boy, Casey Mears, Mears. Casey he, Mears. Is, he is in the Daytona 500. Rookies Greg Biffle and Casey Mears squeezed over the finish line, 14th and 15th, to make the show. Veterans Jimmy Spencer and Kenny Wallace also raced their way into the field. Race number two was a star-studded affair. Green flag, green flag, green flag. Hello. Rewind. Still clear. Still clear. Kevin Harvick's looking strong in that 29 car behind Dale Earnhardt Jr. Second place, side by side. Kevin Harvick, Michael Waltrip on the outside with plenty of friends trying to take over second. Pole sitter Dale Earnhardt Jr. was still up front as the mid race pit stop approached. A pause that seemed to sneak up on Kurt Busch. Whoa, Kurt Kevin Bush. Harvick and Kurt Busch get together. He gets one of the crew members. There's some mistakes. This will cost you getting in the Daytona 500. While most teams took tires, the Budweiser bunch took only a sip of fuel, earning Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s second Daytona win in six days. Finishing all alone in the transfer spot was the family-owned number 49 car of BAM Racing, placing Ken Schrader safely into the field for his 19th Daytona 500. 30 teams made the field from their twin 125 efforts. Another six cars qualified on their Monday qualifying times. Seven more cashed in on provisional starting spots and seven more, including 1990 Daytona 500 winner Derek Cope, would have to head home early. The field for the 45th Great American Race was finally set. Or was it? Valentine's Day was no charm for two of the sport's biggest stars. Johnny Benson smacked the wall during practice on Friday morning. Mark Martin couldn't fix damage left over from Thursday's first race. Both switched to backup rides for the 500. Rusty Wallace finished fourth in the second 125 mile event, but was disqualified for using an unapproved carburetor. Instead of starting 8th on Sunday, he was relegated to 38th. Saturday morning marked the final practice session for the 43 NASCAR Winston Cup teams. It's known as happy hour. One of the greatest misnomers in all of sport. As defending Daytona 500 champion Ward Burton demonstrated, there's nothing jovial about the pressure-packed experience of this crucial last dress rehearsal. Track's open, guys. Track's open. Now one trying to sneak up the middle, one coming in the middle. I don't like this motor near as much as the other one. Can't make anything happen. Go ahead and run one more if you can, if it, if it hasn't uh, started missing yet. Okay, this will give us another good check here. Get a plug check and come look at it. How many RPMs you running? 72 and a half. Yeah. Well, the top of the racetrack was real slow right there. I mean, 
you know, and the whole bottom line was 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 a, was a whole push. Wasn't nobody going up top. I mean, Little Lee couldn't even go up top. He got to the front right there and just stopped. The bottom, the bottom's faster for everybody. Transport. 35 to 45. Didn't cool it down any. Act, act it anything like it has a whole week with that same amount of tape. John, take a quarter inch off that right side top, okay? Quarter inch. Red's gonna be out next time by. Red's gonna be out next time by. 10 4, meet him at the fuel post, fellas. You gonna try to shock with us? We're gonna, I think we'll do both. We'll do, okay. we'll do both. That, that won't be wrong anyway. So we'll just see what that does. And, we'll, and then I want to, um, I got one, I got one cowl piece I'm getting Joe to make right now. Really? And we'll try that okay. some, somewhere like the end of this practice or something, you know? See if it, see if it sucks up, you can see if it sucks up any better. Or... Okay, let's get a build up sheet, Tracy. John, let's change that, uh, that air box piece. Step one. You still never got an you never got an arrow pushing up in there, huh? Still drove good in traffic. Yeah, it drove pretty good. Yeah. All right. Because the tire sheet looks real good. Look at I mean, you you can tell the left front's working good right there. You know. Yeah. Good temperature there. Track temperature as hot as it was Wednesday. It's pretty hot out right now. Yeah. John's got John's got the numbers. We can look. And put that spring back. Uh, the car's bogging down too much in the corner. I'm just a sitting duck right now. It's not doing anything. Uh, it's not running anywhere. 10-4. All right, let's put that back in, uh, Steve, and um, we'll, we'll look at the plugs and go back out. The buildups look good right there. We'll. We'll put this back in the right front, right front, and see what it, you know, just see if it if it helps it at all as far as the bogging deal. But you think it'll tighten it up? Yeah. Don't put it in there, then. Well, we might want to be tighter. I I understand, but we might we ought to try it. Maybe it won't. Okay. I mean, you know, we got nothing else. I mean, that that's the best we were yesterday was with that in there. So let's just put it back and see if you can back out and compare, and then we'll know what we're gonna do for the race. It's tight. Now it's going away a little bit. Boy, was the car any, was it tighter off of four? I mean, off of, uh, yeah, off of four, or was it the same, or could you tell? Tight everywhere. Way too tight on the exit. Let's go ahead and get out of there when you can, Ward. We'll come make one change, go back out. Put the other bar back in it, guys. Let's go back out with the other bar. See if we can tell the difference there. I'm going to wait for that pack to come back around. I'm not going to learn anything right here. Hit four. Got three back there behind you. Much better. Sucked up better down the straightaway and all, but it's hard to get the slide in in the corner. For. Tracy, check the radiator with, uh, with your outside gauge there when you guys get there, okay? I'm going to do it, guys. we only got four minutes left. We're all done, anyway. At 7 a.m. on February 16th, 2003, a hazy sun rose over the Daytona International Speedway. This two and a half mile asphalt challenge to America's competitive spirit was ready to take on the greatest stock car drivers in the world for the 45th time. Richard Petty holding on to that lead like a hammerhead shark. Here he comes, coming down, sinking out. At seven of those 44 previous events, this venerable old track was forced to bow its head to the king of stock car racing. 
from 1959 to 2003. There has never been a Daytona 500 run without the King in attendance. So who better to spend race morning with? A morning of business, controlled corporate chaos, and fun. Yo, guys, how's it going? Good morning. What time's your hospitality? We're leaving. I don't know. <laughs> they just leave me around. I know. I was going to say. Ain't going to get in until we get, get through with all this. I think, I think the anxiety will be about to rain. <laughs> OK, guys. All right, man. Hey, how y'all doing? Just fine. Hey, young lady, how's it going? Good. Could you All sign right. my book for me? Please? Yeah, let's, let's go inside. All right. Because if we get started out here, they'll, we'll gain a crowd. All right, Betty. Fix you right up here, man. Did your driving experience in Texas? How'd it go? Wonderful. All right. <clears throat> now what? <laughs> huh? You must be a maggot. She's attracted yeah, to Yeah, she, she, keep, she keeps returning. All right. Okay. <laughs> it's everywhere, isn't it? Thank you. you See y'all later. Right. Hey, guys. How we doing? OK. <laughs> You're going to get fired. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. Thanks, kid. <laughs> okay, All right, guys. Yeah! Hey, guys, how's it going? Everything okay? Everything's great. You checking them out, huh? Uh-oh. That's seven times checking, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they kept, kept dethroning me, too. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> Glad to meet you guys. Good luck, okay? Good luck for you, All right, See, these tracks were built. This, this track was built in 59, and it was built to run as fast Watch as you could. Here, I mean, that's what racing Watch seems to be all court. about. Who can run the fastest? He said he'll just come by if, here. If he makes it, that's okay. If he don't, okay. that's okay. He's too. trying. They said they asked yeah, him to do something yeah. this morning, so. I'll be back then, though. Okay. What's it feel like to be thought of as a legend? You may not <laughs> Obviously, some people do. Well, I, I don't know. I ain't been, had never been any other way, so. It's not a deal that you can, one day you were something and another day you were something else. So I grew into this after 65 years and this is the way it is. Hey man, who's going with you? I don't know. Who's going down yonder? Could you please turn in? Please turn in, come on, Penny. Which way we're going to go? I did this for 35 years and I've you know, been retired now for like 10, 11 years. And, uh, kind of got used to being retired, okay? Yeah, you'd miss it from time to time, but if you'd have been winning races when I quit, it would have been a different deal. I was losing races then, so I know I ain't got no better in the last 10 years. <laughs> da Daytona is it, okay? Uh, but what, what happened? If you win Daytona, you're a winner all year long. There's a hat. Hey, here, right? They all look the same. <laughs> Big fan, okay? Thank you. I have the record for the celebrity over at your Correct. training uh, driving oh, Is that right? Uh, oh, you're, yeah. you're not going to quit your day job to go drive no, a race car, though, are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't blame you. I wouldn't either. The, the, the cars will be, be a good day to run, but we're going to have to make so many pit stops because of the small gas tanks. So that's going to slow everything down. Time to go racing. It's never just another race. It is our Super Bowl begins our season in uh, State Town. Yeah, I remember coming down here when I was 13 years old, and you know, as a fan, uh, I was always excited to come to the Daytona 500 uh, and to be racing in it. And if I win, I mean, it's, I mean, it's dramatic. This can be an exciting place to be, and it also can be an awful place to be. There's no doubt that this place has you know, just something about it that's special. Daytona is kind of like uh, deciding who's going to race in the Super Bowl or who's going to compete in the Super Bowl and have that before you start the season. When you're watching this sport on television as a kid, um, all, all the emphasis, even as an adult, all the emphasis is on the Daytona 500. You know, to win the Daytona 500 would be a dream come true. Race day 
Day Traffic, isn't it? That's right. Oh, we got love race day 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 He's going to win today. They won't, they won't Sweet. Have Sweet. Sweet. Look, I got a good trophy. It is the grandest spectacle in all of racing. 480 acres, 200,000 fans. They come in campers, cars, trucks, and buses, representing every state in the union, every walk of life. We're coming down the green, stay in line until you cross the start finish line. The number two starter must not be number one starter to the line. It's important that you communicate with your spotters today and your hand signals. Get them up high in your car, signal to the driver behind you. Check your mirrors and give and take. Tighten your seat belts as often as you can. Look across the turns and don't let the drivers try to drive the cars for you. The party atmosphere tempered only by the anticipation of what is about to unfold. Fast, turn left, hope the weather holds up. Hey, Jimmy. Time will tell. I'm so excited. There you go. Yeah, finally here. Hey, buddy, I'm ready to go, man. Daytona 500. Always want to run this race. Ever since she was a kid, biggest race of the year. This is it. Going for it. Mikey. Mikey's ready. Race day has arrived. All of the long off-season hours of work, all of the time spent analyzing numbers, thumbing through endless handwritten notes, all the testing, all the stress, all that labor. The payoff comes in the form of four simple words. Today we celebrate the 45th running of the Daytona 500. Are you pumped, buddy? Uh, pretty pumped and exciting seeing nothing but the face car in front of you. So just looking forward to today. We've been down off, been down here uh, about 10 days waiting for this moment. Uh, and the best thing about it, I got an AOL Chevrolet that can set over in Victory Lane when it's all said and done. So. We do all the right things, don't make any mistakes. We'll have a shot at winning this race. When you win this race, you go down in history. When you're getting ready to take the green flag, and you've got butterflies, that, you know, you see the crowd, you see everything around you that's going on, you're saying, wow, you know, this is the Daytona 500. I sat as a spectator here for 10 years with my dad, and uh, up in the grandstands, just watched the races, uh, you know, Felt the, the air getting pushed by when they took the green flag for the for the start of the race. Reach up and pull those belts tight one more time. Let's go racing, boys! Boogity, boogity, boogity! Jeff Green's time at the front ended quickly. At the front, they're not going to give Jeff Green this first lap. No, sir. And, and you can see already that there's take no prisoners today. We're flat out racing. Teammates, Errol, all bets are off. In three laps, speeds were already reaching toward 190 miles per hour. 43 cars were now separated by less than two seconds. And during lap three, 39 of those cars changed positions on the track. 190 miles an hour, closer together than the cars in the parking lot. The on-track storm had begun as another in the sky. 
was beginning to roll in from the Gulf Coast. The rain is in the forecast, and all these crew chiefs on pit road know it. Could be as close as an hour away, and that will affect the thinking and strategy of all of these crew chiefs. Waltrip paved the way for a fearsome foursome of Chevys. Himself, teammate Dale Earnhardt Jr., defending series champion Tony Stewart, and sophomore sensation Jimmy Johnson. Others employed a wait-and-see strategy, including three-time champion Dale Jarrett, content to assess the situation from the tail end of a snaking stock car draft. Lap 31, the first round of pit stops had begun. Jeff Green lost a tire. Jeff Burton lost a catch can. And then a lap in the penalty box. After 34 laps, Michael Waltrip lost the lead, surrendering the point to Stewart. After five laps in the lead, his teammate was in trouble. Trouble, trouble off turn back. four. A car spins to the infield. Bobby Labonte. Caution is a Winston Cup play. champ. Forty cars quickly ducked down pit road. Some took two tires. Some took four. Others were taken aback by congestion. Dale Earnhardt Jr. took two tires and the lead. With Waldrip in tow. After 55 circuits round the Daytona track, rain clouds began to overshadow turn one. As Elliott Sadler now shadowed Earnhardt Jr. No one had made a major misstep yet. Two cars into the wall in the middle of the field. Ken Schrader is one of them. Another over on its roof is Ryan Newman in the trioval grass. The car flips two, now three times, and comes to rest on its roof just off the front stretch in the trioval grass. Ken Schrader got turned to the outside wall, and now his car gets crashed on pit road. Oh, man. Here comes Schrader, and Newman is in Newman. the air oh. and over. Ryan Newman, last year's Rookie of the Year, on oh the God. rear end, ripped from the car. Newman's ride into the skies shook the rain from the clouds, halting the action after 63 laps and only one hour of racing. The break was a chance to chat about strategy with the team and throw in a little trash talk to boot. When you were on the back stretch, you happened to look over to your left, and what did you see? All the jumbotrons. I can watch the race myself, half of it at least. <laughs> How much can you see going by at 190? Well, there's two of them back there, so uh, I've seen all the replays on all the wrecks we've had and uh, a couple pit stops. I've seen us all the 43 car having trouble on pit road. I don't really know what else is going on when you're up front. Kind of, it's hard to tell who's having trouble and who's fell out and what's happening. So it's kind of boring up there. Yeah, I get good coverage back here. The DEI guys claim they can watch television while this race is underway. How about you? Tell them to keep watching because the 29's coming. <laughs> After one hour eight minutes, Earnhardt was ready to lead the pack back onto the racetrack, but Junior's plan was threatening to short circuit. The car will not fire. Jake Winery ran a battery down there. Tony Uri Jr. is running down there. A number of crew members from the Bud guys are running down to see if they can help Dale Earnhardt Jr. A wrecker is making its way to the front of the grid. Now, this is not the kind of bump drafting that you want to see. Quietly working his way through the pack was the dodge of Sterling Marlin. But as Marlin races within sight of leader Michael Walter, he was greeted by the sight of a black flag. Drivers, this is your warning. <laughs> Race above the yellow line. If in our judgment you go below the yellow line, the improve your position will be black flag. And there he's dipping below the line to pass that car there. Black flag, that could put him a lap down. Again, a mistake you can't make. A one-lap yellow line penalty left the two-time 500 winner seen red and out of contention. Meanwhile, Earnhardt Jr. was becoming less race driver and more electrician. What's that rain right there, Jr.? 11 and three-quarters. 11 and a half. Slowly going down, 
keep running. Let them guys know the first time they over behind me. Things are starting to get all crazy. Yeah, 10 4. Tell Tony, because he's hitting me, man. He's about to cut off. He'll spin me out, Ty. At 100 laps, the Daytona 500 would be an official race, long enough to go into the record books, even if shortened by rain. But that mark was still 15 laps away. Most teams were running on a fuel cycle that would run their tanks dry or near so on the very same lap, including the race leader. Dale Earnhardt Jr. had ripped through Speed Week's 2003 like no other driver in recent memory, winning three races and two outside poles in a span of seven days. On lap 88 of day eight, driver of number eight ran out of luck. Without losing a lap there, Tony, which I know you'll lose one, but I'm telling you, the weather's moving. He'll be in last anyway in another lap, so let's just put a battery in. A failed $2 electrical part cost Earnhardt two laps. He would finish the day 36, but still play a major role in the final outcome. Up front, teammate Michael Waltrip held off furious challenges from Kevin Harvick, Tony Stewart, Jimmy Johnson, and Jeff Gordon. But the real race was the escalating three-way contest between draining fuel cells, threatening skies, and the halfway point of the race. Now, five laps away. Jeff Green goes around, slides up, collects Jimmy Spencer. Under the yellow, the leaders pitted. Jimmy Johnson and crew chief Chad Knauss elected to forego tires and make a fuel-only stop. One lap shy of the halfway point, that move put Johnson out front. Directly behind were Stewart, Waltrip, and Johnson's boss and teammate, Jeff Gordon. And I think we're getting ready to see what it would be like if it was 10 to go, because that's how these guys are going to race. Chevy versus Chevy, Hendrick Motorsports versus Joe Gibbs Racing, and one car slices down to the inside, Michael Waltrip. Dale Jr. is racing to get his lap back. He gets into the side of Tony. Tony gets into the side of Gordon, and Tony turns his car sideways. That that's, may not look like that much, but when it's 190 mile an hour and you get that but far out of shape, lucky to save it. Watch this, he forces his way under him. And I'll tell you, Tony did a great job of hanging on that bad boy. Boy, Michael's all over the back of the 48 car. And here comes his teammate, hey, Earnhardt Jr. I, you know, that's help. But he's not going to give him help, it don't look like. Darryl, he went to the outside. He, all he's worried about is getting those two laps back. Smoke and flame from that last car in line, Mike Skinner. Something broke. On the lap 106 restart, Jimmy Johnson would be the only car at the front without a teammate. Wait, 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 wait. From El Cajon, California, leads them down for the restart. Dale Earnhardt Jr., the eight car member, two laps down after having that battery problem. He would love to clear Jimmy Johnson and take the lead of this race and get one of those laps back well, in the caution command. See, right here, he's going to pull Michael by Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson's hung out to drive. Takes all dough for Jimmy. The 2001 Daytona 500 winner was back in front and soon got an assist from the 2002 race champion. Trouble in turn four. One car spinning around middle of the field and coming back across in traffic. Looks like Ward Burton's car. He crosses the track again, but he'll get away with no one else making contact. And the caution flag is out once again here in the Daytona 500. Under the yellow flag, the rains came again. At 4.15 Eastern, on lap 109, Michael Waltrip parked his Napa Chevrolet on Pitt Road as the leader of the Daytona 500. It just worked out. I didn't think I had the run to pass the 48 when Junior caught me on the back stretch, so I didn't go. And then I uh, had a caution on the restart. I, I thought I had a plan, and 
it worked out, thankfully. Uh, I just hope it rains for a long time. Now it was time to wait. Skies smiling at me. Hey, uh, Nothing Dean. but blue skies do I see. Never saw the sun shining so bright. Uh, <laughs> and all that it'll stuff. It'll be down when it gets night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long are you going to stay here? Midnight? You celebrated New Year's Eve. I'm going to go ahead and plug the generator so they can't run the light. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Clouds broke, then darkened again. The rain lightened, then poured again. Through it all, fans stayed put. Drivers and their teammates prayed for another shot on the track, for perhaps a chance to make a move for the lead, or to get back on the lead lap. With 91 laps and more than 200 miles left to run, anything could happen. But one driver looked to the skies and liked what he saw. For one hour and 10 minutes, Michael Waltrip waited. At 5.25 on February 16, 2003, the Daytona 500 was declared the Daytona 272 and a half, the shortest in history. Michael Waltrip became just the eighth driver to win the great American race more than once. In 2001, his celebration had been limited to only a few minutes, cut short by the tragic news of Dale Earnhardt's death. This day, no one could spoil the celebration, not even Mother Nature. I can't believe it. I was telling Buffy, I heard that it hadn't been shortened since 1966. I said, they're due. It's got to be about time when we got shortened up again. So thankful, so thankful for Dale Earnhardt. Um, he made this place even more special to me watching him over the years and I know his heart and uh, he was about this place and uh, I know he's smiling now Defending race champion Ward Burton, who had worked so hard during Saturday's happy hour, finished 38th after his wreck on lap 106. Ray Evernham, whose hopes were carried by two cars, saw Jeremy Mayfield claw his way from 20th to finish 8th. But two-time Daytona 500 winner Bill Elliott, who ran as high as 2nd, settled for 32nd. Richard Petty did not add win number eight to his trophy case as John Andretti finished 34th with a left rear tire run, although his son Kyle finished 13th after starting 28th. On the Monday morning following the race, Waltrip and crew chief Slugger Labby reached the end of the road to the Daytona 500. It was a road that had started with 52 teams testing in January, then 51 attempting to qualify. And 43 fighting it out on racing's biggest stage. Now it ended with one team handing over one car to be displayed for one year at Daytona, USA. From the lonely winter nights at the shop to the pressure-packed laps driven in front of 200,000 fans, the road to and through the Daytona 500 is long and winding and often cruel. And now it starts again, the road to the 2004 Great American Race. Thank you.